Okay, wonderful. I am so happy that everyone is here and I would love to wait just for one more minute um, as our viewers begin to join us and get settled in. Um, good morning to people from all over the world who are joining us today. We have people joining us from many, many different time zones. So I want to say good morning, but also good evening. And to some of you, good night. Um, so if we'll just, I see that there are people joining us and welcome everyone. We'll just take a moment to get ourselves grounded and in place here as people join us. All right. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. We are so happy to have all of you with us here today. We are gathering in honor of California Mediation Week. And this is a call to action that was introduced many years ago by the California Judicial Council and the State Bar Association. And it was a request of practitioners throughout the state of California to bring forth the visibility and the viability of the mediation movement. And we took advantage of this opportunity today to join forces to learn from and to connect with not only mediation practitioners from around the world, but conveners of dialogue and conflict transformation. So this is an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you today. My name is Darlene Wade, and I'm the Executive Director of Community Boards in San Francisco on the ancestral homeland of the Ohlone peoples. And the catalyst for community mediation began in 1976, right here in San Francisco, when Raymond Schonholz and a team of trainers launched an experiment. And it was an experiment in community justice that became community boards. And since then, community mediation centers and practices have expanded all around the world. And I think it's important to recognize, and I know the viewers today and the prep panelists today deeply understand that we live in a small interconnected and also very highly polarized world where we really have to depend on each other today we have a rare and special opportunity to learn from each other about various methodologies for peacemaking for democracy creation and to explore the challenges the way that culture um, influences peacemaking and the different ways to convene dialogue and problem solving and we hope to inspire each other today and we hope to inspire the viewers here today I want to begin by thanking our co-presenters, the JAMS Foundation, David Brandon and Ellen Bass for participating in this today, helping us put this together, and the Colored Consultancy in the Netherlands, and the Golden Swan, which is a new initiative to build international learning and support. We are tremendously grateful to the diverse panelists who are joining us today. And for some of them, it is the nighttime. And we appreciate your flexibility. We have representation from many corners of the world, from Mali and the Sahel, Slovakia, South Africa, Spain, Indonesia, Lebanon, the Netherlands, and Japan. For those of you watching today, thank you for joining us. We encourage you to engage by asking questions and adding comments in the chat. 
um, my co-moderator today, who I will introduce momentarily. We will be monitoring the chat, so feel free to ask questions and to make comments there. If we are not able to get to all of your questions, we encourage you to join the Golden Swan, um, which is a new, new, new opportunity, a new group to convene dialogue, and we will put the LinkedIn um, link in the chat, so you're welcome to continue the conversation. We are recording this event today. We will post the link on in the golden chat and then the golden swan in LinkedIn, and we will also post it on the community board's webpage. And if you would like to receive a recording, feel free to put your name in the chat and we will send you the recording as well. I have to share with you that Community Boards is in the midst of our annual fundraising campaign. We have an online auction and we are also hosting the 13th annual San Francisco Peacemaker Awards in June that will be coupled with a workshop left, led by Kenneth Cloak, um, who will be speaking about his new book called The Magic of Mediation. And if you would like to learn more, feel free to join our mailing list and we will send you information. All right, so let's begin. Um, I'd like to start by introducing the wonderful co-moderator today, Cindy Luchten. She is just an incredible person and active in the mediation community in the Netherlands. And she is one of the main movers and shakers at Colored Consultancy in Rotterdam. So I would like to pass the baton to you so you can introduce yourself. Mm. Thank you, Darlene and community boards. And welcome to all who are watching us right now. Um, we recognize we are very limited in the time that we have. And we have a great group of panelists who have lots to share with us. But then we hope that today is just the start, the beginning of more connections, of more conversations and hopefully more events. So we begin with a question for all of our panelists. Um, I kindly would like to remind our panelists to keep their response to two to three minutes. So we have enough time to circle back. After the initial introduction, uh, please use just, well, actually just raise your hand and we'll make sure everyone has a chance to uh, share. Um, I think, could we start with Mr. Frederick? Would you please briefly introduce yourself and um, the location where you work, the um, organization you work with, communities you serve, and some of the primary issues? Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, I'm really pleased to share this uh, event with you. Uh, briefly, I am Associate Director at the Carter Center. Um, I'm working with the Conflict Resolution Program on our programs in Mali. We have two uh, important uh, peace building programs there. One is the independent observation of the peace agreements signed uh, in Algiers in 2015. But the uh, most community-oriented work we do is uh, Peace Through Health initiative that we lead in central Mali, a very, it's a very community driven, bottom up uh, approach of uh, peacemaking, mediation, uh, gender uh, integration and inclusion of the communities. I hope I can develop that a little bit uh, later. I represent the Cara Center here. This is a nonprofit organization based in Atlanta in Georgia in the United States, funded by uh, former president Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter. Uh, whose mission is to uh, enhance uh, freedom and democracy through rule of law, um, election observation, and peace building to, to prevent conflicts and to um, work on their health uh, for people in particular with programs uh, regarding neglected tropical disease. And that is the actual uh, beginning of our peace through health um, work. It's a, as I said, the community based work that is trying to leverage uh, health to build peace and peace to bear health. I'm going to stop here and I will be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to hear more about peace through health. Uh, Miss Amy, can you, the same question for you? 
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Amy Cardamon, and I work with Photo Voices International, and it's located in Indonesia. The office is in Bali, but we work all across the archipelago. Uh, and our main goal is to bring underrepresented community voices into decision making. Um, and the issues that we work on, we work on a variety of issues, whatever the communities are concerned about who ask for our help. Um, and that would be natural resource management related to mangroves and fisheries and forests, access to clean water, to education and to health care. Um, also issues around sexual harassment in school settings. Um, child early and forced marriage, and women and young people's inclusions in uh, village decision making are our main areas. I look forward to engaging with you all. Thank you, Amy. Fika, can you please answer the same question? Thank you, Cindy and Darlene. Um, I'm very proud and honored that we uh, finally have our uh, first um, webinar also uh, under the name of the Golden Swan. Um, my name is Fika Johani from the Netherlands and I'm the founder and owner of Colored Consultancy, a mouthful. So we choose the name COCOM is much easier in the daily use. Our work is focused on community building and the motto of us is um, for, by, and with neighborhood residents. We started the first project neighborhood mediation in the Netherlands in 1996, inspired by the community boards of San Francisco. And we were very honored to celebrate both our anniversaries last year, 45 years for the community boards and 25 years Community uh, neighborhood mediation in the Netherlands. And um, from that uh, point, we celebrated together in Rotterdam and we are now continuing our collaboration and hope we can expand it with, with you all, the, the panelists we meet uh, today and the viewers, of course. In 2001, neighborhood mediation was followed by youth mediation in which teenagers and young adults were willing to donate their spare time to mediate in neighborhoods and in schools. And currently we are operating in Rotterdam and three other cities offering neighborhood mediation to about 850,000 citizens with 140 trained volunteers who are supported and facilitated by our team of team coaches. And beside that, we have our COCOM training division in which we offer trainings and workshops for volunteers and professionals. Um, on subjects like communication and conflict resolution, but specialized in neighborhood mediation. And the main issue we deal with is neighbor nuisance in general, varying from noise disturbance to bullying to disagreement over the use of and behavior in shared spaces. And our goal is to improve and restore the relation between neighbors which on the long term also contributes to more livable and peaceful neighborhoods. And I'm looking forward to exchange uh, with you all, um, well, experiences, tips, perhaps common issues we can work on in the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Fika and Carolina. Thank you very much for inviting me for this webinar. My name is uh, Karolina Mikova and I am coming from Slovakia, uh, from the organization Partners for Democratic Change Slovakia. And actually our organization was co-founded uh, by Ray Schoenholz after he uh, established community boards in uh, San Francisco in United States. And uh, during the time of fall of communism and, and big transformation in Eastern Europe, he decided to come to our region and to establish uh, very diverse approaches to conflicts uh, as a something which is necessary and needed for democratic society. So uh, we are one of the organizations uh, he helped establish in the global scope, I would say. Uh, 
At, uh, currently, we are working uh, in three main areas uh, in working with polarization or uh, deep divides in society, uh, trying to find approaches how to create the spaces and facilitate dialogue between people with different values, with different priorities, but mainly related to the cultural differences or culturally uh, different approaches. So that's one area where we work. Um, the second is citizen participation. And that's actually very much my area of work. By profession, I am urban planner and political scientist, but, but having the training in urban planning and in plan planning of cities, I am very much interested in conflicts, public conflicts related to the development. So very often we come and help to create transparent uh, participatory process of making decisions about development of the city in different contexts. And the third area we are working on is uh, helping civil society organizations to strengthen themselves, to build civil society in different countries. Uh, we are working in Slovakia, in Central Europe, in Europe, but also in some other countries, uh, thanks to the network uh, in which we join together. It's, it's called Partners Network. So that's a short introduction of myself and the organization which I'm representing. Thank you, Carolina. Hisham, please join. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. So I'm Hisham Kantar. I'm, um, I worked as a judge in Lebanon for around 18 years. Uh, I am a senior fellow at the Weinstein International Foundation. And in, uh, in that regard, I uh, came to Columbia Law School as a visiting scholar in the last few months working on research on mediation and criminal cases as a transitional justice process. So I also worked with organizations within uh, New York City in Brooklyn that do restorative justice work. So basically, this is the field I am interested in and I practice uh, and I did uh, have a, a trial of uh, mediating criminal cases back when I was a judge in Lebanon. So I did try that for a few months, especially during uh, the COVID crisis. So I can share a, a little bit about, uh, about this experience uh, later on. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm, I'm working as a legal consultant for the World Bank, but I'm also pursuing a PhD uh, on basically uh, mediation and, and, and criminal cases as a transitional justice uh, tool. And uh, thank you again for having me and looking forward to discussing with everyone. Thank you. Aruna, can you please answer the same question? Please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Varuna Bhandari Gognani. I'm a, a mediator and a trainer in uh, New Delhi, India. And uh, I, I was trained by um, Mediation Conciliation Project Committee uh, of Supreme Court of India. I have been practicing law uh, for the last 33 years. Uh, as the, um, I was hearing everyone that there are uh, community boards uh, pursuing uh, uh, dispute resolution, we do not in India have as, uh, as of now, but certainly um, I have been um, like during the pandemic, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ministry had picked me up for uh, helping uh, people with matrimonial disputes. And uh, 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 like I have uh, been in uh, collaboration with a, uh, uh, with a foundation called uh, this is KP Bhandari Foundation. I am doing a lot of awareness programs amongst lawyers, students, uh, universities, school management, various hospitals, and also government departments. Uh, I provide pro bono services to the needy and deserving parties. 
I have dedicated one day of my uh, week for community mediation at a, a non-profit organization called Delhi Dispute Resolution Society. Uh, as you know that India is a diverse country, it is infused with innumerable religion, social and linguistic diversity. We have people having different religions, different languages, uh, beliefs, cultures, regional diversity, unique way of living. So Delhi is itself a mini India. And as a mediator, I have to deal with the people from different religions, cultures, customs, beliefs in mediation. In uh, mediation, when people belong to different regions and customs, they come, mediator has to make themselves aware about their customs and deal with them accordingly. Um, I just wanted to give, them, give an example. In some part of the India, it is matriarchal society and some part of the country, it is patriarchal society where head of the family is the father. So when the succession takes place, so it takes place differently. So uh, as a mediator, I have to be aware of all the customs and the uh, divergent uh, beliefs of the people. For the neighborhood disputes, the, uh, the residents uh, in a particular society, uh, they can be belief oriented also. Like uh, they can be following a particular uh, belief. In one of the matters, they, uh, it was uh, a, uh, a resident society where uh, I was faced with a situation that they wanted uh, to settle the family dispute by building the house, but they wanted the builder of the same belief and the purchaser of the same belief to be going ahead with it. So um, uh, as a, a mediator, I have been uh, like uh, dealing with diverse uh, um, uh, pe uh, like uh, people from different communities and I try to bridge the gap. And uh, as my uh, organization, uh, I'm, the, uh, the, uh, I'm the person who's running it with collaboration with uh, the government of India and uh, trying to do a lot of awareness uh, amongst the students, uh, whereby they should be able to uh, approach the different ADR mechanisms uh, as and when they come into practice. So, uh, Ms. Farina, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting here. That sounds very interesting and we want to hear about this. Um, we come back to you. Can we, what I'd like Ms. Uh, Kiko to introduce herself first. Hello, I am Kiko Tanaka. Thank you for inviting me such a wonderful chance and wonderful opportunity to, to meet all of you. I am Keiko Tanaka, Japanese private mediator and family court mediator and trainer for the mediation. Mediation, And I started to learn mediation in 1998, and I had a mediation training at London and the United States, including community board training. And I started private mediation organization in Tokyo in 90, uh, 2003. Mediation theory and idea and the concept was introduced around 1997 in Japan, because at that time, the judicial system reform is beginning promoted in Japan. And ADR, especially mediation, in attracting a lot of attention that uh, period. However, as I will discuss later, the culture of discussion, uh, culture of Japanese, it is has taken root in Japan for more than more more than one hundred one thousand and five hundred years. Now, as a family court mediator, I'm working for family issues, divorce, including international case and inheritance issue. On the other hand, as a private organization, clients who have neighborhood dispute or family dispute are coming now. 
Yes, my goal in to run with everyone, the Japanese everyone, the conflict is not special thing. It's a conflict is the usual thing. And to in and promote resolution is big. Uh, promote for the the conflict. We can resolute conflict by myself and by own self. I would like to saw that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Alish, please introduce yourself. You are still on mute. Yes, no. Good evening. Here in Barcelona is, I think, 6.26 p.m. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm waiting to learn with you today. I think that I'm the youngest in the panel. Then, uh, and I have uh, listened to you that you have a lot of experience and I'm going, I'm going to learn a lot of you. I think that what I'm going to tell you uh, is not less important or less interesting than you, or this is why I, I try to explain what I'm doing right now, okay? I work for an organization called Pere Terres, and we focused on service management and social action and mediation. Uh, currently, we coordinate different citizen services and community mediation uh, services in different municipalities of the Catalan territory. Mm, at the same time, uh, we manage prevention services in neighborhoods of Barcelona to promote to promote civic, civic engagement. Okay, and in the in these services, we work for um, three points: prevention, prevention, and alternative resolution of conflicts between people, families, and groups in the street, public areas, or or a school. Mm, the second one, we promote uh, values of dialogue and culture of peace, nonviolent communication, skills, and positive attitude to complex situations. And the third and the last one, um, peaceful repair of damage caused in our communities to restore re re relations. Okay, This is more or less what we do here in Barcelona in our services. And uh, I'm glad to be here and hope we enjoy it together. <laughs> Thank you, Alish. Thank you so much, everyone, for introducing yourselves. I feel like we're just warming up and getting to know you. I would like to invite the viewers to put any questions that you have in the chat. Um, we would be happy to get to that. And I would just like to open it up to each for each other. Um, if there's anything that you would like to ask each other um, before Cindy and I um, ask the next question to get us started here, to get the wheels moving. Is there anything you would like to share? Frederick. Yeah, as a general uh, remark or question for, for everyone, I'm, I'm and we seem to all have very different type of experience but uh i have a, my, my general question would be how do you make sure when you you talk to people you you, you uh, mediate in communities how do you make sure that you talk to everyone how do you bring everyone around the table that's that's one of the questions we have in our situation in mali especially with women or youth for example who are uh, harder to mobilize or people who just oppose a conversation and dialogue so that would be my general uh, question for you to share as an experience how do you how do you reach out to people who are not ready to come around the table to to talk with you thanks that's a fantastic question. I'm looking at Amy and Carolina because I know that you're also convening complex conversations. Maybe we can start with the two of you. Um, so that is an excellent question. And uh, we focus a lot on um, bringing underrepresented voices and that really includes women and young people. Um, so when we are about to start a project in a village, we will um, purposefully go around to, in Indonesia, there's there's groups like women's groups and youth groups, and we go and talk with them and um, bring try to bring people in that way. And we um, soften or sweeten 
the proposal for them to be involved by offering uh, photography because it's photo voices. And a lot of people come for that reason initially because they're, they're, they might be not wanting to get into conflict or not wanting to have the light shine on them, but they're interested in learning about photography and they're interested in the issues but they may not, some of them may not be ready yet. So we bring them in first very softly through photography. That's really interesting. So you're kind of starting where they're at and kind of pulling them in based on what their curiosities and interests are. And you are thinking about how to move them into engagement and dialogue. Exactly. Like leading them where they are. Yes. Um, good morning, Professor Williams. We are happy that you are joining us today. Um, we've gone around and done a, a little introduction and we'll come to you in a moment, but we are um, asking a question about how, how, how different practitioners here today in different parts of the world and live, working in different cultures and communities with very different um, and complex issues get people's voices, get people engaged in this work. And I would like to pass the baton to Carolina. Thank you very much. Um, I would be very happy if I have answered to your question, how to involve everyone. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's uh, definitely the goal which we have in uh, most of the participatory processes to really reach out to very diverse communities and to be able to speak in the language which is understandable and close to very diverse people in the communities. Um, just these days, uh, I'm, I'm working in a smaller town in Slovakia, it's called Trnava, and we do participatory process uh, related to, to prioritizing public spaces in this town on which the city should focus, where they should fundraise the money to reconstruct or rebuild the public space. And uh, we are using very diverse tools for involving citizens. The, today, the most easy is to use the internet, the voting through the internet. Uh, it's very easy for the municipality to use that. But as we, as the practitioners know, knew, uh, it's not really reaching to the people who are not so easy and able to uh, to work through the internet. So we, at the same time, we are organizing public meetings in different parts of the town, uh, usually uh, in the uh, in the spaces where seniors are gathering together. So two days ago, we had the meeting in such a such neighborhood. And uh, as it is usual, many people came to the meeting with different agenda. They were coming, some of them angry, some of them disappointed, some of them having something to say. And we have to be in these cases very patient and open to try to kind of target the goal of the meeting at the same time to listen to needs and the priorities of the people in the way how they are able to express that. So I definitely do not have answer to your question, but I'm trying to find it in different practices. <laughs> Who else would like to jump in? I know Varuna, you were talking about bringing together people who are very, very different with religion, cultural beliefs, different ideas about matriarchy, patriarchy, and bringing them together to, to have dialogue. Any, um, any tips or techniques that you use to bring people together with very different values? Oh, I think you are muted. So um, in a situation like this, what we try to do is tell them to make a group of people who follow a particular belief, right? So uh, what they want. So, uh, and then instead of letting them speak all together, we tell them to have a leader. 
like choose one person who is your spokesperson and tell the person to jot down what their problem is so we make different groups and then those groups the person who leads the group and the problems they come in uh, uh, you know uh, talk to the mediator and um, uh, otherwise it becomes a total chaos we uh, like everybody would be speaking something different so uh, like if the 10 people uh, talking uh, one thing uh, there will be a person uh, who will be leading their uh, concerns so uh, that is uh, how uh, i have been doing it here so it sounds like you work through a representation model and you convene the voices of people who aren't there by the by the channel of their representative alish Yes, in, in our um, community mediation service, um, one of the tasks is to, to generate community spaces in order to detect the different needs of the people we work with. Because um, one of the points is that uh, for, for us, the prevention is one of the important, um, like, uh, one of the important arms of the service. Then we try to generate these spaces and try to analyze what are the needs of the people, then we we try to make this prevention so uh, then the conflict uh, is less than it should be if there are not uh, political of prevention. Uh, darling, you are on mute. All right, thank you. I want to turn my attention for a moment to our new guest, Professor Brian Williams, who is joining us from South Africa. And I read about your incredible work um, from a young child working with issues of discrimination and political oppression to your work today, working with um, gang violence in South Africa. And if you could go ahead and introduce yourself, we would be very grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, I see briefly, uh, I'd like to just, in South Africa at the moment, we have um, constant electricity outages and cuts. And so we experienced um, electricity outages in the area where I live. And so this created a disruption for me to be able to, to gain access. I had to move to another venue in order for me to be able to log on. So uh, uh, so briefly, that's the context in which I arrived into the space. Firstly, thank you very much for having me. And, um, and to all the panelists and also those listening, um, South Africa, in South Africa, we are, are extremely proud of having endured some of the worst types and typologies of violence. Um, so we have still, as we are chatting here, we have an uninterrupted, uh, you know, chain of, of uh, transgenerational violence and transgenerational trauma. So um, even when we speak about mediation, the idea that emerges is that you mediate in response to a conflict. But we have a permanent state of, of destructive conflicts which exist. And in particular in the area where I live, Cape Town, um, where since uh, well, 1652, when a Dutch multinational arrived, they decided to assume ownership of the land, issued uh, their staff members with leasehold rights, title deeds, and immediately destroyed the local indigenous culture language. And so Cape Town became the first point of the conquest of the rest of South Africa. So the brutalization that people experienced was first in Cape Town and lasted for at least 150 years or more. Slavery existed here. And so Cape Town, despite its tourist beauty, is also a place of deep pain and deep trauma. And it has been identified as one of the most violent cities in the world um, because of the structural violence that has in, entrenched itself in every sphere of society. South Africa is also the most unequal society in the world. So we have to emerge out of these different, very, very, very serious challenges. Um, 
the only true solution to dealing with the different typologies of violence is peace. And there are different ways of understanding the nature of peace and in fact, mediation as well. So while we speak of mediation as a particular way of uh, bringing about peace, making peace, um, it's also crucial to understand that even though you may mediate um, and resolve at one level, you need to find ways to, to keep the peace, to have systems in place uh, to ensure that what you have agreed um, must now find a way to be enforceable, capable of being monitored, capable of being evaluated. And then, of course, you need to have a way to transform um, the conditions which exist through peace building and a range of other things so that you begin to create a new culture, a new way of doing things. So there, there are some examples. Um, whenever you're ready, I'd like to share some real examples of some of the complexities because, um, in the South, again, in the South African context, we have significant language where we live in official languages, but there are also different social histories uh, which exist in different parts of the country. And so we also have to find ways to navigate that. Um, and we also have the kind of trauma that people have still not addressed um, to this day. So we also need to have a trauma informed approach in terms of how we deal with issues and the way in which we find solutions. Um, so while we've been able to uh, create some, in, in our view, some of the most exciting models for reorganizing entire communities, um, it's not easy. Uh, you also have to guard against elite capture. Those are the smartest, always looking for opportunities for themselves. And if it means they have to collapse a project, they will do so to, to advance their own interests. So, what we have done is to try and multiply uh, the leadership and we, we make the responsibility of each of the people involved in the mediation and peace building process. The responsibility is to reproduce leaders, to multiply leaders. And so, for example, in the one community where I'm working and where we've done, in my view, uh, groundbreaking work, we've created, uh, we've, we've split the community into different zones so that you have a, a healthy competitiveness. So all of the things that impact on people. So for example, in zone one, you say every, all the children must be at school. All the seniors must be taken care of. All the uh, people who have different kinds of disabilities, chronic illnesses, uh, there must be no violence. Uh, health services must be provided so that we are able to then find ways within very undignified and oppressive circumstances bring about a measure of dignity generated by the very people who have impacted and affected by the problem. They're the ones that have generated solutions. And all that we do is the, we are the enablers to ensure that they remain within a particular frame and we provide the necessary capacitation with different partners and act in solidarity to elevate them to higher levels of reason. My very last point, on Tuesday, we have our Human Rights Day celebration. So in this informal settlement, um, we are having a peace tourism into an informal ghetto where there's no running water, no electricity, no sanitation, no refuse removal. In fact, there's absolutely nothing. People are literally living in a bush. So we've been able to recreate a situation in that uh, violent community to say, let's look at peace tourism. In order for tourists to come here, what do we need to do? And so it meant that a new kind of thinking uh, became necessary for people to be able to accept the ownership of transforming their own conditions, liberating themselves in a way that makes it possible to regenerate and in fact to have uh, a means to uh, provide for themselves and their families because almost all of them are unemployed um, in many, many uh, different kinds of um, in, in different ways. Some of them uh, simply, they've fallen off the edge of society. So it's about, it's, it's incredibly beautiful to see how people become alive the moment they feel a sense of hope and a sense of achievement that they have achieved and all that we do, we are the enablers. And then of course, in this particular community, we have two principal partners, the Catholic Church and the, one of the primary schools, which serves as, a, as an agricultural laboratory. So the principal, has been able to bring people in to assist with food gardens, um, 
Thank you. Different kinds of plants. And, and through the planting, the therapy, therapy also emerges for, for different families. I, I I hear, thank you I so much for sharing that. I, I better stop the, there because if you don't stop me, I'll con just continue. <laughs> we will have you back. We can learn a lot from you. Um, but I think it's interesting how what I'm hearing you say is that the methodology of mediation is an organizing principle in the communities that you're working in and that it is really important to look at the deep historical traumas in order to bring healthy communities to, to bridge and to build healthy communities that it's really important to look at the history and not just dealing with the issue that is being presented and i imagine that that is true for many of you and hisham you had mentioned that restorative justice is a area that you're moving into that it's both as a judge and as a practitioner and restorative justice practices, which are, you know, high, mediation is a restorative justice practice. Conflict transformation and convening community is a restorative justice practice. But tell us a little bit more about in your work in Lebanon um, and in a deeply polarized area of the world. Um, how are you bringing forth these principles into the work that you're doing? Sure. Um, so um, as you probably know, conflict is not foreign to, to Lebanon. Uh, the country has witnessed uh, civil fighting for uh, over a decade. Uh, and uh, this led to um, kind of the elimination of a culture of conflict resolution through dialogue. And um, uh, ordinary justice was not able to fill this gap of uh, people uh, just not being used anymore to resolve their conflicts uh, outside of the courts. So, um, and then my work as, a, when I was uh, working as a judge in Lebanon in a criminal court, I realized that the large amount of cases we were getting was partly due to the fact that people were not used to this kind of dialogue anymore. And for them, it was much easier to go to court. But as you know, with the huge case backlog we have in criminal courts uh, and um, the fact that we do not have the necessary number of judges, uh, these cases were taking a lot of time uh, to be settled, which created a, a certain tension both between the both parties of the of the case and between people and their judicial system because they perceived it as slow but but also as inefficient so i during the covid pandemic especially during the the the, the periods of uh, lockdowns that there were that there were, the, the strict periods of lockdown I, uh, I had people who were under pretrial detention and who were waiting their hearings, but there were no hearings being conducted because of COVID, exactly. And so I initiated a process that is kind of in a, in a non-law non zone because there's no law that prohibits expressly this kind of mediation, but also there is no practice in terms of mediating criminal cases. So... I um, started a kind of process that mediated the uh, matter of pretrial detention and not the whole criminal case. And uh, so when a person who was detained waiting for trial asked for their release, uh, I used to conduct a very informal kind of mediation, but in court uh, between the detainee or their lawyer and the plaintiff, uh, just to discuss the matter of whether this person should remain in pretrial detention while they were awaiting uh, their trial, knowing that we were under uh, the COVID pandemic. And I realized that it just doesn't take a lot for people to engage in a conversation, but they needed, first of all, they needed the right forum, but also they needed someone who uh, they trust in terms of engaging this process. And in Lebanon, judges have this standing because we come from, from a culture of conflict resolution that is very informal. We come from this culture, um, as many parts of the world, 
were elderly and uh, uh, notable people in the villages were used to, to, to play this role. And so therefore judges have the standing where they can be trusted by both parties to initiate this conversation. And I realized that the effect of that is not only on the case that I was looking at, but it's also engaged a more, a, a, a broader conversation on why do we resort to justice? Why do we go to court? And what actually matters in, in this dynamic between plaintiffs and uh, offenders? What did you learn about what really matters? What really matters is act, it's, it's, it's not, people do not care for, to, uh, to, uh, uh, do not really care about having a sentence like having a judicial decision that is written by a judge that sentences someone to a prison sentence or to a fine or et cetera. People want to be acknowledged, people want to be listened to, and people want to, to have a more informal kind of justice, especially in criminal cases. If we're not talking corporate law or civil law or real estate, in criminal cases, in most, of, uh, I would say 70 to 80%, people just do want to be acknowledged. Thank you so much for this. I think Thank we can you. all agree. I see a lot of our heads saying yes, we, we have experienced this as well. And probably people in the audience today, the viewers um, can relate to that. And I think that's a wonderful segue for us in the last remaining half an hour that we have to share some of the successes where that acknowledgement, where the parties that are participating in these processes and these we have different processes here um, where that acknowledgement really did transform a conflict that you help shepherd forward and i'm gonna see if fika would like to share a story so i would like for you to think of a story to think of an example where the process that you are leading them with the methodology that works for your culture and plays that through the process Yes, well, I think, of course, for uh, in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, our uh, neighborhood mediation is um, um, for a case is not as severe as we are talking about until uh, now, like in Lebanon, South Africa. Uh, but it is, um, we started the neighborhood mediation, especially um, to prevent escalation and to contribute to uh, uh, better neighborhoods where people like to to live and share their neighborship with uh, with others, and I can relate to what Hisham also say that also in these more uh, simple or or uh, less worse uh, cases, um, the needs are the same. People need to to, to feel um, listened to that they they are acknowledged in the problems they experience and. We focus on creating by dialogue the, the understanding between the uh, involved neighbors so that they can relate to um, the nuisance the neighbor experiences. And um, if you can come to that level, the, the, that's the, the, the emotion and the feeling which is under the, 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 the actual problem like the most uh, cases are about uh, disturb uh, noise disturbance, but it's a wide uh, subject. But mostly it's um, the, the expression of there's something under it in which the, the neighbor doesn't feel acknowledged. And um, well, um, I had said we have thousands of media mediations done in the, in the, uh, over the years and um, there was well, there's one which I re remember is very special. Like um, there was this old lady, and um, her husband passed away. And their garden is I think it's uh, if, if you compare it to the other situation, is what are we talking about? But in a sense, it's it shows how important it is how that that people uh, learn to listen to each other and and and. Um, well, looking for for solutions um, together in which you can, uh, which are acceptable for both of them. But she um, uh, had um, that her husband passed away. The garden uh, what was there 
uh, life and they got new neighbors from another culture, ethnic background. And uh, in her point of view, the, the garden was not uh, well um, maintained, uh, the neighbors, and uh, it, it had impact on her garden. Well, to make it a short uh, story, uh, they uh, found mediation um, and they were, they came into dialogue and the uh, neighbor didn't knew, know that the garden was that important for her. And um, um, the end was that he offered her to maintain the garden of her and uh, uh, make the, their own garden a lot better. And she offered uh, them to take care of the children when necessary. So it's it's an example of uh, a win-win. And that is actually what we try to, to uh, uh, reach in uh, neighborhood mediation, that there is no, no winner or loser, but that they find each other through dialogue. And um, also that in, uh, contributes to a better relationship between neighbors. I hope people can relate to this uh, example, but um, well, there are many more. And also um, we see that the, the issues are getting more complicated. And to my point of view, it has a lot to do with, I think everyone can relate to that. Uh, the increase of polarization uh, in in uh, um, in all our communities all over the world. If it's war or if it's like uh, people um, getting more and more um, uh, on the on the, the, the having the, the opinion that this is my house and um, I have the right to to um, live the way I want and without. Uh, taking uh, um, care of the neighbors. So that's an issue we are facing. And I'm very interested in how others deal with polarization in general and how we can deal with that to, uh, in our neighborhoods and communities. Thank you, Fika, so much. I thank you. That was a, a beautiful story. And, you know, the personal is political and it is both at these small neighborhood levels, but also these larger city and urban and state related levels, too. So it all makes a difference. I see Varuna would like to share. Uh, I have a couple of stories. I will go through them very quickly, you know. Uh, they, there was uh, this uh, uneven distribution of uh, property uh, between the family. So uh, what uh, uh, I did was I created a living will uh, where uh, the, uh, the two sons came with the father and uh, there was a division of property uh, as uh, the father wanted it to be. And uh, the control of uh, disposing of, of the uh, property uh, in his lifetime was retained by him. And a settlement was arrived at. So uh, this was uh, one uh, you know, uh, very heart touching experience. Uh, that, uh, you know, the father was unable to keep peace in the family. So uh, another uh, uh, matter was where uh, there was a, a family name uh, which was, which was uh, used by two brothers having a huge uh, business. And uh, so they, they could not uh, venture into exports uh, because of uh, the dispute on the family name to be uh, used uh, as the trademark. So uh, in the Supreme Court, the, it was marked to me to settle the matter. Uh, so uh, I sat with them and then, uh, um, so, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, when I spoke to them and tried to understand why are they fighting for the name alone. So, uh, while in a private session, one of the brother told me that uh, the other brother had mentioned in his success story uh, to him as black sheep of the family. 
and uh, that was one reason why he did not want the other brother to use the family name so um, uh, not, like without disclosing uh, but, uh, you know and um, uh, like uh, listening to them though the matter was not settled but uh, we got a way out by which they used both of them were using the family name but in a different way and the relationship was restored the communication between the family was restored and uh, now like uh, both of the families are progressing really well so um, that was uh, another matter that uh, you know where uh, you know there was a lot of hard burn and uh, they were not able to communicate with each other and uh, you know and uh, let the and it was on the surface a trademark issue which was not really the issue so actually it is the hurt it is the feelings which you have to uh, get the people you know speak up uh, and uh, you know most of the time if you are able to establish the communication and tell them to uh, about their future relationship and uh, the pro, uh, the progress so uh, they can make if they collaborate i think that makes the uh, things work very nice yes varuna you talk about establishing communication and i think that's very important i'm also very interested in uh, miss kiko you mentioned before that in the japanese culture it's it's not common that you actually uh, talk about conflicts or problems how were you able as a mediator to get parties engaged <laughs> it is a very very difficult point for for for, for japanese people because the culture of harmony is very important for the japanese it it is at the same time we avoid confrontation so the japanese people don't want to talk about the conf conf their confrontation to other people so we need a time for case management or intake or for the mediation style, because just one party has a dispute with another party, it's it's a kind of the family dispute. They don't want to talk to the second party directly, so they access to us. So they want to us to communicate with them, uh, with second party in uh, uh, on behalf of still or her or the, that first the first person but it is not mediation so i have to explain what is a mediation is so it, it for uh, for me it is a long training for for to both parties so each party have confidence to talk inside from them so and and they and then they have a power to talk to the second party and they have a confidence to they have a, a meeting and they have a mediation session in in both party with mediation mediator so that is a japanese mediation private sectors mediation organization style so we in so intake and the case management we we need a one year or half a year for for wow. that to have a to have a joint session so because we need a time so because so that's the reason it's very high hurdle and very very tight to me a very very difficult point to me and the second point is court mediation is very long strong influence and uh, a strong point for the japanese culture so because the uh, uh because the japanese mediation system come uh, began 645 or, or almost 1500 years ago <laughs> it, uh, uh, japanese mediation style began and after the second war we changes uh, uh, dynamically and uh, very, uh, another western style mediation style and another western style come from the 
Western countries. So we improve that mediation and uh, uh, another legal system is changes after uh, after around uh, 1,200 uh, around that. So, so but after the war, after the war, after World War Two, second, that changed dramatically. So we are we improving now. So as all said, the Dina, uh, uh, Dina, uh, uh, also many people are including uh, uh, in Japan now. So we have to change. So we have to improve the mediation skill and the mediation theory to the uh, to the Japanese people now. Okay, one year for an intake. Uh, that sounds. You must be a very patient person. <laughs> yeah. Like a counseling and the coaching style. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, Mr. Frederick, what is it? How do you get parties engaged in your program? Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, just like briefly, the context in which we work is the context of war. We have, uh, that Mali has been at, at war continuously for the past 10 years. And we work in central Mali, which is the epicenter of the conflict. It's been taken over by jihadi groups uh, related to Al Qaeda, uh, counts uh, multiple uh, uh, ethnic militias fighting each other. Uh, there's a lot of uh, intercommunal conflict and intracommunal conflict. Uh, the, the state is practically absent and has been absent for practically since the independence of the country, but even more after the war. So all that creates a situation and it's a traditionally or, 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 or and also geographically a, a part of the, of the country that is extremely difficult to access and is a little bit out of sight of, of Bamako, the capital. So all that has created long-standing grievances, a, a huge a level of uh, mistrust between the local communities and the government. Um, there's also an um, uh, issue regarding access to resources and the fact that many groups are marginalized with this access within communities because uh, control of, uh, of resources is in the hands of a family, certain families who are inheriting this, this right. Uh, there's no access to justice uh, except through the jihadi. And so all that makes it uh, extremely, uh, and, and no NGOs were working there be be before we came in, but um, uh, the way we, we the, the little spark that helped us uh, get people together was health, because uh, the Car Center is uh, assisting the Ministry of Health of Mali in, in different eradication of different um, disease, but working within the network and health workers, health remains a little bit of a, uh, a bridge for, for peace. It's it's at least a common goal for everybody. It's neutral enough for uh, for all parts of the communities, all combatants groups, even the government and the jihadi, to agree that having a bare access to health for everybody and civilians in particular, but also themselves, is, is, is important. So that's how we started the conversation. We had some entry points in, within the communities with the health workers from the Ministry of Health who maintain a form of access, uh, even if very difficult, and also because there are a, a traditional uh, mechanism for uh, for health uh, and, and practitioners within the community. So a little by little, we put people together around the idea of uh, trying to build a uh, cooperation and build trust of, uh, with some incentives regarding access to health, but that, that comes at the end of a process because I, I'm not a health specialist or development specialist. I don't want to be. Uh, I work in conflict prevention and peace building, so I'm trying to 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 integrate everybody with, with a sense of like uh, conflict mitigation skills, so that the communities take ownership of the transformation. And, and what Professor Williams was uh, mentioning earlier about the dignity and, and ownership of solution and transformation resonates a lot with what we're doing. Uh, we don't bring the solutions ourselves. We're trying to give tools and, and, and uh, empowerment to the different components of the community so that they both know how to, to integrate every aspect of dialogue, uh, conflict prevention, or gender sensitivity to their work, and also uh, turn uh, uh, them into solutions for everyday life. Just a, a very, very short uh, success story. Uh, 
uh, when we, at the end of a process of uh, workshops or, or dialogue and mediation, we, we were going to, to, to build what we call the health packages, which is like the set of activities we can go to. And of course, in our mind, it has to integrate everybody, every level of the society. But, um, but it's not easy because there's contention between, between the different communities and everybody wants ownership or wants to have the most uh, outcome out of uh, a development uh, thing, but but together the communities agreed on on building after, after a dispute to build a, a well system, a war well system in the most uh, uh, disenfranchised uh, community, which was at war in conflict with the other ones. But through dialogue and visits, they actually agreed like, well, this is definitely the community that needs it the most. And they also prioritize in every activity uh, women and youth because they understood that uh, they were a huge part into the integration of that. I have a million of stories to share, but I'm going to stop there. There, but uh, I think overall, uh, restoring dignity and 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 empowering uh, ownership of uh, of transformation are our keys to to long-standing success in in, in peace building. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love this idea of like finding common ways for people to converge. You know, it's you have, again, we're back to some similar themes of you have kind of the long game in mind and looking at what brings people together. What do they care about the most? What is really their interest right now? And how does that interest act as a shared way of convergence? Um, who else would like to share? Just kind of open it up and see what's kind of bubbling up for you. If there's something that you would like to share. Hey, Amy. Hi. Um, so I saw that there's questions about how do communities or uh, participants know about the services. You, for us, it's usually through another NGO partner who calls us in um, to support community engagement or uh, work around something that where there's some level of conflict. Um, and I thought I wanted to share quickly two stories just to give you a sense of how we do the work in Indonesia. Um, we were working in a small fishing village in West Kalimantan, and um, we asked for volunteers to participate in the program and focus on women and youth and other underrepresented uh, voices. And one of the young women, wanted to bring up the issue of access to clean water. And several other people in the group were hesitant for her to do that and kind of um, were shutting her down a little bit because they were concerned because there's a palm oil company right on the edge of the village that was rumored to be siphoning off the water, but they had family members working for that palm oil company. So, um, what we did was we, we asked them, you know, are those two basic rights? Do people have the right to be employed and do people have the right to have clean water? And they could agree on that and then take it up to the more the sort of invisible partner, which is the government. Um, and so that's what we did, um, what she did, actually, because it was the young woman who did all the research with photographs and interviews and data and brought it to the government. and during an exhibition of all the issues that came up. And the next day, the government um, came to the village um, with a team from the Public Works to work with the community to develop a plan for, for water access. And I'll share one more story very quickly, if I might, because it's very different. Um, and that's around sexual harassment in a community uh, at a school. And we'd asked the, the kids, what was the main issue? And the girls said, that was their biggest issue on a daily basis was being sexually harassed at the school, on the street, at the temple. And um, so, and the boys, we interviewed them separately and they concurred that that is, that was really happening in the girls' lives. So we sat down and studied the issue in the context of patriarchy um, from a global and then bring it down to Indonesia as a country then bring it down to Bali as the province and then to the small village with, and had them go out and do research about it and come back 
Um, and then what the sort of the final thing we did was have a deep listening exercise. Um, but we, because they're teenagers, we made it into a talk show so that it would be interesting for them. And we had five girls talk, older girls talk about their experience of sexual harassment and how it made them feel. And the boys listened quietly and respectfully. And then the then there was five boys who spoke and surprisingly, or not really surprisingly, but several of them spoke about um, being harassed as children. And then believing that they were teasing or trying to flirt with the girls, but not, you know, they didn't realize that they were hurting the girls. And um, when they'd heard that they were really hurting the girls, they turned around, they stopped doing it. They wrote a song about it to educate other people and started going out to other communities and educating um, at other schools about sexual harassment. So those are the two success stories I want to share. It's interesting, this power, this the power that we're describing, that all of you are describing from, you know, the courts, from the level of, you know, people detained in courts down to the very, very grassroots community level, the, the themes here are very, um, very interconnected. I see the Professor Williams would like to share. Hi there, thank you very much. Uh, and you're correct, uh, Darlene. Um, some really fascinating insights from a number of the participants. Um, and collectively, there's so much for all of us to learn uh, from, from the inputs that have been provided. I perhaps want to just share, in the South African context, within the workplace, mediation is compulsory. So we don't choose a mediator. A mediator is appointed within the conflict, within workplaces, as part of the process of first resolving uh, conflicts within workplaces through mediation. And then once that uh, is successful, it's good. If it's not, it moves to arbitration. Um, and and uh, so in, the, in South Africa, there's an attempt to try and insert within society at different levels within society, um, the idea of mediation. So we've also moved to the courts where the courts have taken the approach, uh, the extent to which they're able to mediate uh, problems uh, that court appointed mediators in, in order to try and resolve things. Within the broader society, it's a bit more complex. It's a it's really open season. And because we have these multi-layered unresolved conflicts um, which, which exist, it's largely left to individuals or communities or leaders or organizations to make interventions. And so we, for example, use a transformative peace model where we recognize that the intervention has to be activist based. It, it cannot be on the basis that we're simply seeking to overcome a problem, but fundamentally we haven't shifted the balance of power and we haven't shifted people within a, a state of violence or conflict, destructive conflict, to become strong enough to move beyond that. And so that is our approach. And so we're not neutral when it comes to the question of peace. We take a position um, and it's not easy because we have to have a nuanced approach around how do we engage as mediators within a particular space without being seen to favor one of the parties. And so we have to find uh, very creative ways of rather posing questions um, within mediation spaces and in the process of posing questions, uh, guiding the other party, the ones with lesser power, to recognize what options they have. We also have um, deep ideological contestation in South Africa. For example, one of the high schools in Cape Town, and it's, uh, if one Googles that, Heathfield High School, lots of information about it. The entire school shut down for two weeks. The education officials are not allowed to come into the premises. Um, the teachers are not allowed to go to classes to teach. And within 48 hours, we were able to get the kids back to class, the teachers to teach, and the education officials to come back onto the premises, uh, and also to take over the running of the school. In part, it's because as a mediator, my history of activism with a number of the groups who are ideologically um, engaged in this particular conflict at the school was a significant factor in helping to give me that access to be able to, uh, with them, come up with a solution based on what you actually want to achieve, you know, and what are the interests of the children which should be primary and paramount to everyone. 
And so with, within the approach that we have in dealing with, with conflict zones and violent spaces, even within the peace work that we do, we constantly have to be engaged in mediation. We have to mediate even between those seeking peace within uh, communities to ensure that the balance of power is such that we're able to, to strengthen and capacitate those um, who feel uh, that those who are the noisier ones, the more aggressive ones, they're the ones who are able to, to move ahead. So we focus on issues of inner peace and we get people to understand that the, the philosophy that must guide the way they reason must be from a peace perspective. And so it's also crucial for mediators to be courageous. Um, the, the, this particular high school where the contestation took place, I was falsely accused of assaulting a female teacher, which is untrue. Um, a criminal charge was filed against me because there was an attempt to try and get me not to mediate. Um, and when I continued to, uh, to push ahead and mediate, a criminal charge was filed against me. And well, fortunately for me, uh, the cameras at the school showed that no such incident took place, and it was then kicked out. Um, so mediate is particularly in, in very, very uh, deep seated areas of conflict need to recognize that there's danger attached to what they do, and they have to be centered. They have to accept the responsibility of the role that they play in order to shift the balance of power. As recently as the Saturday past, um, on the 11th of March, in, the, in this huge community where I'm working, the law enforcement officers came onto, the, onto this particular, into this particular area and decided to break down um, a housing structure that had been erected. And when I went to talk to the law enforcement officers to find out, number one, do you have a court order? Number two, who was your commanding officer? They did not reply to me. Uh, and when the people in the community moved closer to them, they started shooting everybody. And in the process, I was also shot by one of the law, by one of the law enforcement officers. Um, so peace and mediation in particular does require people to be spiritually centered and does require people to have integrity and virtue. But ultimately, our role is to ensure that those who are the least within the space where the, the least power must be capacitated so that they can become their own liberators. And in that way, we can build um, from peace a whole new identity and idea of what is possible for people in terms of transforming their lives to one of dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are, Darlene, we are getting close to yeah, we have eight minutes left. If any of the panelists have any more questions, short question for a short answer, uh, now is the time, but we have to start thinking of coming close, ending. It doesn't mean that our conversation has to end, of course. I believe Sarah will put the link to our Golden Swan page where we can continue this conversation, where also our panelists and our watchers can put questions there and we can continue this. Is there anyone who has one more question? Yes, yes. Allow me to dive in quickly. Sorry, I apologize for that. Very quickly, um, Mr. Wright. But, I, but yeah, but I do want to, I want, firstly, thank you very much, darling, for putting everything together and having all of us. It's absolutely wonderful. But also I'd like to, um, to invite people to come to Cape Town, to come to South Africa and to see the kind of work that we're doing. Um, we are a country in transition, even though we have democracy, democracy has not delivered peace, has not delivered justice. We are, we in certain, in certain respects, we are far, far worse or with much greater levels of violence. So mediation and the roles and the models that you use, we can find ways to, to collaborate and set up something in Cape Town, South Africa. And we'd like to invite all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Darlene, I think we need to close. All right, let's just see if anyone would like to have a few last words that we didn't hear, perhaps. Clearly, there's this is just the beginning, and there is so much more. I would love to hear more from Carolina. I would love to hear more of your success stories, if you have one to share, because you are using a aligned methodology that is really about a convening um, conversations and in, in with stakeholders and and supporting them 
and if you and Alish, we also didn't hear perhaps from you as well, if you had a story to share. So maybe we can end with a few of your stories. I will be very short. I will try to be very short. Uh, I, I was just thinking about the, the case uh, which was happening actually here in Bratislava in Slovakia. Uh, very close to our office. Uh, it's a public space uh, uh, where something like five, six years ago, there was quite a huge conflict between the designers who brought uh, to this kind of park in the old neighborhood with the uh, neighboring building uh, uh, being accommodated mostly by the older people, by seniors. Uh, young designers brought the, uh, the ship containers and built a kind of hipster space for design and uh, and the modern uh, uh, sh uh, bike share and, and other kind of uh, for young people targeted activities. And it was quite a big conflict from that because it was a disturbing life of the neighborhood. And people started to write petition to the local government. And it was big tension between this new initiative and the people living in the neighborhood. Uh, it was quite a long story. I will not talk through the whole steps of that. Uh, it actually led to the change of the mayor of the, of the part of the city because I was not able to deal with the situation. But at some point, uh, we were invited to somehow help the municipality to talk to the citizens, to the neighbors, about what they actually would like to use the space for. And we created the process of involving uh, neighbors in discussion in, in, through the interviews at the beginning, then in common discussions, how they envision, envision the usage of the public space. And after some time of discussion, creating some summary report from this process, there was um, art architectural competition for designing space uh, based on the request from the citizens. And today the space is rebuilt and people are using it very vividly and, and it's living space. That's a beautiful story. That's a very democratic process. It's super wonderful. Very short for me. And um, one reflection and one success. Uh, the social dynamic of individuality is uh, like a powerful machine that it may fragment us. Then maybe one of the aim of the restorative services should be to connect the people to community spaces. Then I, I remember some cases that uh, situations have been transformed in the neighborhood because people have been engaged to social movements in the neighborhood. They, then the, the, the conflict so don't exist because of this, because of the engagement of the people to community spaces. That's really fantastic. We're going to have to wrap up. This is, feels like just the flavor. We just had a taste of this cross-cultural and international communication. So we are going to convene more of these conversations and we will, I love this idea of Professor Williams of having a little brigade of traveling, a traveling learning brigade where we can visit each other and learn from each other and see how these methods work in different contexts. Um, thank you so much to our audience today um, for joining us and to our panelists, of course, thank you so much for your time, for sharing, for your generosity. Um, a thank you to the to Color Consultancy, Fika, and to Finod, who was watching today, and to Cindy, and, and to the Golden Swan for this beautiful international collaboration, and to the JAMS Foundation. Please share your um, information with us so we can um, stay connected and keep you posted about upcoming events. I think that this community we have found is a community that loves to learn. It is a 
community that has a tremendous growth mindset. And the more that we can share with each other and learn from each other, um, I think we will be able to serve our communities better. So we look forward to more of this. And um, thank you everyone for being here. We will be in touch. Okay, happy mediation week. And thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you Judy. Thank you. Take good care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye to everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. It was such an honor. It was yeah, an honor. Was Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, 